Hello everyone, welcome to Voices on Social Justice. We feature voices of innovative and compassionate experts in society to discuss cultural and systemic issues that impact racial and gender equality and equity, all of which affects American education directly. Today's topic is on the role of philanthropy in education and in challenging times. We're still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that has hit the Black and Hispanic communities the hardest, and we continue to see violent acts against people of color. We would be remiss to think that these societal events do not impact teaching and learning in the classroom. And in computer science, in a discipline with a multitude of opportunities and ways that it impacts our daily lives, you know, it begs the question, can computing skills help reshape how information promotes positivity and well-being for all people, regardless of uh, race, gender, and identity? And how can we best use technology for social good? So we've invited a really special guest today to help us with some of those questions. I'm super excited to introduce Josh Elder, Director of Grants Management at Siegel Family Endowment, based in New York City. We're gonna talk about some of the philanthropic measures that provide grant opportunities for work around STEM and computing education that can potentially solve for some of these societal issues that we face every day. Just wanna give you a warm welcome, Josh. Thank you for being here. Hi, Lynn, thanks so much for having me. It's great to see you, albeit virtually, uh, but really excited to be with you today to talk about this topic more. Yeah, yeah, so um, Josh, before I ask my first question, I'd love for you to say a little more about you so um, our audience can get to know you a little bit more, uh, where you grew up, where cities you've lived in, and how you got into education. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where to begin? I mean, I guess at heart, I am a farm boy, I guess you could say. I grew up in rural Southern Virginia, uh, a long ways away from New York City where I currently live. But yeah, was uh, um, went all the way through school, K through 12, in a small rural community in Virginia. Went to undergrad and grad school in Virginia, a few hours away from where I grew up. Um, uh, interestingly enough, knew early on that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, as you can imagine, some people were supportive of that. Others said, you're absolutely crazy and insane. You're going to be broke for your entire life, but you get the summers off, so you'll be happy. Um, but I think I just knew I was fortunate enough to have quite a few male teachers, which we know isn't usually um, uh, the, the kind of normal experience for most people. And those teachers just had like a strong impact on my life and said, you know what? I kind of wanted to be them. I uh, wanted to be the science teacher, the coach, um, and the teacher that just was so into providing for students and creating opportunities. So graduated, went into teaching directly out of undergraduate, had no idea um, what I was doing as a 21-year-old teaching eighth graders, um, but loved it. Was really fortunate to have a mentor teacher and just a great school system. Uh, in Richmond, Virginia that supported my development um, and uh, stayed in that for a few years, went into uh, uh, the traditional, so left the traditional public school setting and went to the charter setting in North Philadelphia, which I could spend hours just talking about that transition, um, but learned so much about just a different city and context, the charter world, um, and really just continued kind of my growth and trajectory uh, of being a teacher and getting into leadership and just understanding my students in such a different way. If that wasn't enough to continue my kind of moving away and moving up the coast, decided, you know what, I'm gonna just pack my bags and move to South Africa. Um, so I had an opportunity right. to do a fellowship program that led into me moving uh, to Cape Town, South Africa to teach uh, 9th through 12th grade uh, uh, chemistry and physics and do teacher development work. 
And then that led to an opportunity to open up and be a co-founder of a network of schools that was based in Johannesburg in South Africa and then in Nairobi and Kenya. Um, again, I think the kind of, it sounds like a crazy story, but the common theme was going to places that have been marginalized, that have been underserved, that not to be the savior, but to understand the society and to figure out how to best support and uplift and develop the next generation that's going to actually like really carry that society to move forward. Um, and so that the populations, whether it was in inner city Richmond to Philadelphia to South Africa, kind of was the, the unifying theme there. Came back to the U.S. about five years ago um, to go to graduate school. And then uh, I found myself in the computer science space um, and was working at CS for All and kind of where I encountered you, Lynn, and the great work that you all are doing at Constellations. And again, uh, I think the, the reason why not having a computer science background, but the driver of my kind of passion for this was around equity and access and understanding what could be unlocked for a child's potential if they had access and equitable access to CS, something that I didn't get when I was growing up. Um, and so just really love that work that I was doing and thinking about strategy and how to make sure all students across the U.S. and even internationally had these opportunities. And then uh, a year ago, found myself here at Siegel Family Endowment uh, on the philanthropic side and understanding kind of the role of philanthropy. Um, and so it's been such a great journey um, that's led from rural Virginia with in a population town with a population of less than a thousand to now living in New York City uh, with who knows what the population is here um, uh, in the millions, but definitely yes. have, it's all been a, a journey that I think has been interconnected uh, through some common values and beliefs that are just central to me. So happy to be here and get into this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Joss. Um, what was it like experiencing COVID in New York City? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe it's been a year. Uh, since lockdown and quarantine, uh, I think for me, uh, it was really, and I was just reflecting with a friend about this, it was truly like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, so thinking back to a year ago when the city shut down, even a few weeks before that, just as we all did, the, the searching for hand sanitizer, toilet paper, mm, just yeah. common daily items, weeks before the, the quarantine hit, you couldn't find it. And then to have that moment where the entire city shut down, nothing was open, eerily silent outside. Um, it was just a crazy experience, but also in some way, something that I think unified us. So I think back to the the seven o'clock uh, time frame that happened every night where we'd be on the balconies or out of your window, clapping, banging on pots checking on your neighbors to make sure if I'm going to the grocery store, my elderly neighbors, do you need anything? Like making sure everyone's just okay. I mean, it was definitely a struggle. Um, I had COVID early on and I think mm. it was probably got it before we knew it was in New York, but luckily had a really mild case of it, thankfully, and was able to recover quickly and had very mild symptoms. But it was definitely, a challenge and to see how different people were impacted, whether it was the artists that were on Broadway or restaurant workers yeah. or just the challenges of people working from home and having families and having to adjust uh, in terms of now being the teacher and parent and doing everything all inside. Um, but I think it's been really rewarding to be here in New York. and. And I think that model, like, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I mean, I think that is just, like, reinforced even more so that if you if you made it here during the pandemic, you can definitely make it anywhere. Um, and so just to see New York City rebound now is exciting. Um, recovery that it will take to get back to the, the new normal. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to support New York in that journey. Oh, well. Uh, we're glad that you're here, you know, to share your experiences and your expertise. I did not know that you, um, you know, had had COVID early on. Um, so, uh, really glad that you're, you know, okay now. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, 
uh, just living those experiences, you know, hearing that from you actually, you know, it, it is, is um, really still eye-opening, you know, for me, I watched that on TV, and so I couldn't, you know, I mean, I imagined, I, you know, what it would be like, but just hearing it from you kind of really helps um, feel that sense of unity that, you know, grew out of, you know, the lockdowns and, uh, you know, a sense of, hey, checking in on each other. I, I still think that's super important for us to continue doing, and I hope that that continues, you know, after um, after we get through, you know, the, this, this exactly. pandemic. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So let's then shift into you know your um, your role at Siegel Family Endowment. I really like how you couched your experiences around understanding society to support and uplift you know um, uh, in in your uh, professional journey. So tell us a little bit about your role and the types of projects that um, you know you're working on in terms of funding. Um, Maybe you know, let us know uh, uh, how you're incorporating social justice issues, how those play out in the projects that um, that that you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. So at Siegel Family Endowment, with my role being Director of Grants Management, I essentially oversee our three interest areas or portfolio areas, which are learning, workforce, and infrastructure. And so thinking about how to create a strategy within each of the portfolio areas that ties into what we have as a very kind of broad mission and mandate as a foundation, uh, which is for us to, to really understand and shape the impact that technology has on society. And so as you can imagine, with such a broad mission, there's so many different things and ways in which we could carry out that mission. Uh, but it's really exciting as we look at that and think about finding potential partners and grantees, we kind of look at three different ways in which to do that, um, uh, to kind of figure out what that looks like within each of our portfolio areas. So kind of our first viewpoint or the way that we tackle that is that our kind of viewpoint is we believe that philanthropy is like society's R&D. Um, where we can be able to be innovative and find really interesting, ambitious projects and people that are out in the world doing these things, but need support to continue to kind of uplift and take them to the next level. So finding people that are addressing and tackling some of society's broad issues that are super relevant and timely given what's going on. The second piece is understanding as much as that, as we're looking at it from a holistic macro view, knowing that there isn't any cookie, cookie cutter approach. So what we kind of have coined, and you're here, our executive director, Katie Knight, mentioned this a lot, is that context is key. That no two organizations, even if they are, let's say, in New York City, are exactly the same. Even if they're serving the same communities, let's say they're both focusing on communities in the South Bronx still very different, even though they're similar, context is key and there's gonna be a lot of differences. And so for us, it's understanding that each grant and the way that we go about it, the context really drives that, the relationship we develop with the people are critical and core to that, which is why we kind of customize our process and customize the experience we have with each of our partners, because we know their context is uh, definitive of where they're at. And I think the, the last piece that we kind of focus on or look at is that we know that there are a lot of philanthropic organizations out there. There are a lot of nonprofits out there that are doing similar things. And so for us, we try to find different organizations that are tackling some of these pressing problems, but maybe, maybe in a unique way or they have a unique approach to that. Something that hasn't necessarily been replicated as widely as other things that have been proven. And so how do you kind of support early on or early stage ideas or people or initiatives to be able to help them bring that to action or carry it to scale? Um, and so those have been kind of the three pillars as how we have been sourcing, looking for our potential partners, potential grantees to help elevate and carry out the work in which they're doing in the field. 
Yeah, I think that, um, you know, just having experience, um, you know, with the Siegel Family Endowment actually being one of our supporters here at the center, which we absolutely appreciate. Um, one of the things that I have really appreciated is that um, customized process and experience that you're talking about, um, that no org is exactly the same, right? And that we were really addressing a very specific problem that we had identified um, in the Metro Atlanta area and that that really helped, like you said, like lift you know, the work uh, that that um, that we felt was important to do. And and I absolutely think that that is uh, important. Um, so I just want to say that it's truly appreciated. Uh, I also think that the last um, point about finding organizations or efforts that are tackling pressing problems with unique methods, that that absolutely can drive innovation, which is very much needed, particularly in the CS Ed space. So J uh, Josh, I wanted to ask you, like, like, how have you seen the impact, you know, of uh, philanthropy on CS education, particularly in broadening participation and increasing equity in the field? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that has been something that has been central to our learning portfolio. So whether that has been some of our early investments and support with the Scratch Foundation, with the CS for All movement, or the, the CS for All work within New York City, um, but I think that focus kind of grant funding that allows organizations to like either build the capacity uh, to take on equity and access in a more meaningful way um, or funding specific programs, it's critical. Um, uh, and so I think we have tried to balance that with also thinking about sometimes the funding just needs to be general operating support, right? For organizations to think about, okay, where do we need to go? What's next? How do we figure this out to be able to, again, keep that equity and access piece? If they're thinking about broadening participation, making sure it's at the focal point. Um, and so I think for us, when we've looked at that, like I said, the, the three that come to mind in terms of our support or how we have been able to kind of make sure that we're broadening participation and increasing equity. So I think one would be our support of the Scratch Foundation, right? And I think most people, especially listening to this and, and in our space, they know Scratch uh, and the work the Scratch Foundation has been doing. But I think for us, one of the, the strong driving factors for our support was the fact that it's like, one of the largest free, open, accessible coding platforms. We all, we know that, but like that for us, that democratizing piece of access is critical, right? That if we're talking about broadening participation, increasing equity, making sure everyone has access to that, having finding programs and initiatives out there that are doing that, that aren't actually putting more barriers in place for access. Um, I think the second thing that comes to mind, and you probably know this program really well, thinking about the work Diane Levitt has been doing both in Cornell Tech and the Teacher in Residence program, knowing that if we're talking about CS for all, or if we're talking about computational thinking and integration, oftentimes the barriers there to access would be that only one teacher is doing it. Um, and so how can you, we decided, how can we support the Teacher in Residence program to put coaches in the schools to make sure all students are getting access and it's not just by luck of the draw which teacher you get for that year and so that was another kind of way for us making sure again that we are putting equity at the forefront forefront that again that equitable access to cs and ct is critical um and then the the last piece for us i think as we scope outside of new york and think nationally is our support of CS for All, um, as you know really well. Um, but I mean, thinking about the national kind of systems change level, right? And so again, how can you support a movement that has this as core to them that will help others think about, again, bringing in that context as key piece, knowing that it has to look different depending on where you're at, but how do we support others doing that is critical. Um, and so that's kind of how we started and where we've been going with being able to continue to push for just broadening that participation, but making sure it is equitable um, and accessible to all within that. Yeah, so now I'm going to ask you a uh, question about uh, how 
we've been able to prioritize computing education or, or computer science education. Do you think COVID-19 helped or hasn't helped make CS a priority? And uh, what do you think it's gonna take? <laughs> if not, what do you think it's gonna take for CS to become a priority in, you know, in schools? I, I mean, because we're talking about democratizing computing or you know, at least access opportunity and success, right, for students in computing, um, especially in areas where you know, that there's no computer science. So what's your, you know, what are your perspectives about how uh, a pandemic, you know, has helped or not helped yeah. prioritize CS education? And if not, what do you think it's gonna take? Yeah, I mean, this is something I have been thinking about a lot in attending webinars, looking at the programs we've been funding uh, and just asking people, um, especially teachers as well, my, I think, initial thought and reaction, I think, one, it depends on where you are. Uh, it depends on the infrastructure that was set up in advance, uh, because we think about some places like here in New York City. I mean, I'm sure there's still students that still don't have devices um, uh, to be able to access hybrid and remote learning. So yet alone, even thinking about CS, they can't even focus on any other subjects. And so what I've heard is that there were some very difficult choices, whether it was from a capacity standpoint, whether it was from just figuring out how to spend the time in re the remote learning environments. But I, I think we'd be naive to not believe that ultimately, I think the progress and the traction we were making around CS definitely has been hindered by the impact of COVID and rightfully so because the biggest priority for some schools is just making sure families had the basic needs met. Were they able to stay in their house? Did they have food? Like that was, I mean, let's be real, with the pandemic that was happening, CS was probably the last thing that was on some, uh, some principal's radar. Just making sure that, are my families okay? If someone's impacted by COVID, do they have access to proper medical care? And so I think that's the reality, especially in the communities that we know have been hardest hit and disproportionately impacted by COVID. I will say what I think makes me optimistic about the future is that people still realize the importance and the value of computer science. And I think also because we've been, we've moved into this online environment People that had a fear or a barrier around using technology or being just scared that technology was going to take over or didn't understand it, I think their eyes have been open to the possibilities. And so I think there is a window of opportunity to build on the fact that we've been in this like strong and rich technology environment for over a year now. And so how do you capitalize that and making people understand computer science maybe in a different way than we had approached it before um, and making it accessible uh, and making people think about kind of why it's important, how does it fit in? It's not replacing anything, but it's complementing everything else and how, what it looks like in society. So I think there's a really unique window of opportunity that as we start thinking about what this next academic school year is going to look like, how do you frame the key messages to pick up where we had left off uh, to make sure that people realize that computer science is as important as any other subject and it's not this or that, but how do you integrate it and make sure that it is just a critical and core component of a child's educational journey? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you that this is an opportune time to leverage the value of computing skills, you know, as a way to improve lots of systems in America, government, healthcare, education, you know, um, uh, and, and uh, even housing, you know, as you mentioned, um, that all of those things, if leveraged well and correctly, I think could mm -hmm. improve on those systems. And so with that, Josh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you about was on um, pedagogy of our education system. What do you think needs to change 
in order to best equip, I would say, both teachers and students to be able to, you know, contribute well to the teaching and learning of computer science, to advance society, to contribute to improving society. What are your thoughts on, uh, on, on the teaching and learning of computer science? Yeah, this has been a question that has been central to our learning portfolio. And, and I think the pandemic actually created an opportunity for us to reevaluate this and think about kind of what, what needs to happen when we think about the structure, the content, the pedagogy. And we, in addition to our work that's happening in our infrastructure portfolio, where we kind of look at infrastructure in terms of physical, digital, and social uh, elements of infrastructure, mm -hmm. we realize, you know what, that lens actually needs to be applied to learning. Uh, and so when you think about, and, and our executive director talked about this uh, one day in a meeting where we were like, look, we know that our students need to return back to in-person learning, but they don't need to return back to the broken system. And I think we all can agree, like this system has been broken for the longest time. It didn't break due to the pandemic. It's been broken and we've all yeah. been trying to fix it, but now it's even more important and other people realize it's broken that maybe ha have been ignoring it. And so to, to address the broken system, we feel when we think about structure, content, and pedagogy, you've got to look at the physical, the digital, and the social elements of infrastructure, right? So the physical being the actual built environment of school. And again, we're not arguing that kids need to be back in person and in the, the physical school building, but also let's be realistic, when they were in the physical school building, we weren't getting equitable, high quality teaching and learning to all students, right? So we've got to think about how do you reimagine that space and what does that space look like? Who is that space serving, right? The role of digital infrastructure. And so thinking about the role of technology, right? And we were just talking about just how we've been in this technology rich environment and we were kind of forced into it. What does that look like when we get back into the school building? Uh, on one side of the spectrum, I've heard conversations that People are worried that are we going to move away from technology because we've we've been in front of a screen for a year. And so when we get back into the school building, will the special sauce be the teacher and no technology? Or how do we infuse what worked? What have we learned from this? And we know technology isn't the, the end all be all, but we know that technology can enable better quality teaching and learning. So what's the role of the digital infrastructure? And then the last piece um, is social infrastructure the role of the community, right? Like, unfortunately, we know back even just two years ago in a normal environment, usually community is separated from school. Parents come in, parent-teacher conferences or other interactions, usually they are, are brought in, not for the positive, but for the negative. But now the community has actually been the ones that have had to do a lot of the teaching uh, and working with students because we've been remote and communities have had to uplift and, and support students. So how do you bring the social element of infrastructure into schooling and what does that look like? Um, and so that's kind of our viewpoint of how do we reimagine this and reshape this looking at physical, digital and social. I think underpinning that though is the pedagogy, right? Like again, we would be naive to say teachers, we're expecting you to teach in a very different way but then we're not gonna support you in how to do that. So that's where I think that pedagogy and the support to do that is critical to make sure that teachers are set up for success in order to set their students up for success. And so that, that backbone of support is really needed if we're gonna push for a change moving forward to fix the, the brokenness of the system. Yeah, I, I again, <laughs> agree with you on the supporting, you know, the teachers part. I think as part of, you know, developing and growing uh, more computer science teachers or even with the existing teachers now, that there, there should be, I'm, I'm looking forward to a shift in really looking at the pedagogy and the teaching and learning of computer science. Um, you know, when, and I think we have a, we have a really good opportunity uh, at the beginning of the next academic year 
to bring, you know, these teachers together and involve them in that shift, in that, you know, changing mindsets about leveraging technology um, to reach more students, to dive deeper in, you know, to the success of all students in computing. Uh, you know, I think now is the time um, to be able to focus on that. I, I still I still think teachers play a critical role in that. Absolutely. And, and I think to also understand that, like, good pedagogy is good pedagogy, regardless of content, right? Like, good yeah. pedagogy is content agnostic. And I think that message to me is really critical that, of course, there are subtle nuances based on uh, um, the, the curriculum. Again, as a former science teacher, sure. I know I have to do a lot of learning to be able to teach computer science effectively, but the pedagogy that's needed to be an effective science teacher is very similar and identical to the what is needed to be an effective CS teacher, right? And so understanding that there's so much integration that can happen, because I think that's a key for administrators and others making these decisions that it's not something that you necessarily have to do in isolation. Building up the content knowledge and that support, yes, that you have to, I think, contextualize and differentiate. But what you want in terms of good pedagogy in your school is what you should see in all classrooms, regardless of discipline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that will greatly help create that sense of belonging for all students, but especially for the students who have been, you know, left out uh, traditionally, um, exactly. you know, in computer science. Uh, that's going to be super important as we move forward. Um, so just to kind of circle back um, uh, uh, in your role at the Siegel Family Endowment, um, wanted to ask you just some suggestions or some recommendations for things, you know, that make applications stand out. When, when, when people are submitting uh, grant applications, what are some suggestions that you have for them to make their application stand out? Yeah, I, I mean, one thing I'll, I'll put out a disclaimer for the work that we do at SFE or Siegel Family Endowment, we don't solicit or take RFPs or applications. Um, of course, that doesn't stop people still submit things. Um, right. But I think as a person that was just recently on the other side of the table having to submit grant applications, uh, as all of us are so familiar with in the nonprofit world, I think kind of my, the things that I either remember doing correctly or incorrectly, or as I've been building up a network of others in similar roles now in the, the philanthropy world. I mean, I guess the, the one thing I would say that stands out to me is I think oftentimes we know it's such a challenge to secure funding, right? And we want to kind of seek out all the different avenues and opportunities and funders that are out there. But I think taking the time to understand the landscape, because the work that we do uh, and the areas that we invest in could be very different than a very similar foundation, right? Like just because you look at two funders or other funders and it seems like they have a, a similar mission and you, you're like, oh, they're funders, so of course they're gonna wanna give money and they care about education and CS falls within that. But truly, I think taking the time to understand kind of what is that mission of the organization? What's their vision? Where have they invested in before um, in terms of to kind of see where you are similar or maybe maybe different? Um, and then understanding kind of what they are looking for in terms of impact, right? Like because we know some funders are out there are very metric driven. Right. And we are we try to strike the balance of being in between that we definitely care about impact and outcomes and we want data to support that. But that's not the end all be all. We also on the spectrum when we think about qualitative versus quantitative data. Right. Do you want to secure funding from someone that's going to require you to meet some really strict milestones and metrics? And how does that mesh with what you're trying to do? Um, so I think just taking that time to understand the organization. I, I know that's challenging because sometimes organizations might not have a lot of this information available publicly, but looking at, again, what's on their website, if they list previous grantees to get a sense of uh, the, the work they, they've been supporting. Um, and then I think making sure that if it is an application process, that you are as clear and articulate as possible about 
why them as the funder and what that funding is going to allow you to do, right? Like whether you are applying for just general operating support, whether you want funding for an existing program, whether you want funding for a new initiative, that narrative and the reasoning behind that to me, I think are really critical when I have conversations with people, even though we don't do the application process, but once we decide to get the grant recommendation process started, it's really important for me to understand how will this funding help them do X, Y, and Z and have them clearly articulate it versus me trying to articulate that for them. Yeah, that that's uh, absolutely makes sense. You know, being able to really describe the environment and the characteristics that are going to have an impact in the work that they want to be doing, you know, I think is really important um, to be able to describe, you know, very clearly, and 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 that that is a significant driver, uh, you know, for doing that work. Um, so I I think that was great. Thank you for sharing that. We. Um, you know, we also on this uh, on this podcast, Josh, we also talk a little bit about how computer science can impact lives in terms of upward mobility. Um, mm. You know, we really focus on the opportunities for upward mobility in um, in underserved communities, and um, wanted to ask you, um, you know. What are what are some what are some of your thoughts about how we can do better in that aspect in in terms of computing education, computer science education, to provide those pathways to upward mobility, uh, particularly for young females and young people of color um, that are often really left out of those opportunities. How can we do better in that area? Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, I think for me. It's going to sound like a really simple response, but I stand by it. Like, we have to start earlier. Um, the work that's been uh, done um, in the years past, it's great, right? Like, we've, we've pushed it down from, at first, it was the focus on high school, right? Like, we've got to get the, the APCS courses. Okay, then the push was, we know high school is too late. Let's start thinking about middle school. And then uh, it's like, okay, what, what? else is out there? How do we go lower? And then elementary school becomes a scary thing that people are like, well, I don't know what integration looks like. How are teachers going to deal with this? But if we're talking about pathways and we're talking about mobility, you have to start earlier because middle school is too late. High school, we know, is too late. Like you have kids that are going to go through this pipeline and not realize or not have access to the opportunities or not have opportunities unlocked for them because we were too late for them. We didn't serve them early enough. And so I think we have to figure out what does that look like? What does early exposure and access look like? Again, I feel like a broken record, but like from my time at Sears for All, the equitable access as well, like access isn't enough. The broadening participation piece is important, but we can't stop there. It has to be equitable access to go back to the, the analogy that, again, it can't be luck of the draw that I get the third grade teacher that has CS knowledge and has integrated CS, but my, let's say I have a twin brother who doesn't get that. And so then in fourth grade, luck of the draw, I get the same, I get a new mm -hmm. teacher, but they also have CS background. And so now I've had two years of this. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen, that it doesn't matter the teacher that you get. You're going to have exposure and access to it, no matter where you are, no matter what classroom you're in, because that pathway to upward mobility starts as soon as you are starting school, right? And so how do you make sure they're supported on that journey? And then be able to make the, the choices about how far they want to take this. Uh, do they want to be a CS major? Or do they just want to use the skill sets that they've acquired through CS? And uh, no matter what their career is or whether they go into the workforce or go to university. And so that's why I feel like we, we have to start earlier if we're truly believing that CS is uh, a gateway to upward mobility uh, and pathways. Yeah, strong, strong point there. Um, uh, you know, uh, and and on it, it's, I feel like you're right. We have done so much work in the upper grade levels that um, 
it's really time now to really think about what computer science looks like in the uh, elementary grade levels because that's where you can really you know get kids excited about computer science um, get them thinking of, start identifying themselves in computer science um, you know that 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 can keep them motivated uh, throughout their educational career um, I think that's super important and, so, and I think from that piece I think you're just to uplift that about seeing themselves and see yeah. us it's so important and, and it doesn't just mean like a poster right like yeah, it doesn't exactly. just mean you have uh, black and brown people on a poster that you're like that's representative of what you could look like you truly have to make sure it is relevant and accessible and people can see themselves and whatever that might look like and outside of the stereotypical pathways of cs as well right because i think there's long the long holding narrative of uh, an en engineer or working at the top companies like that's great and all but there's so many other pathways that are possible and so showing them and providing that exposure things that i still don't even know about because i've had limited exposure right and so making sure that this generation can see themselves in cs no matter what that looks like is critical yeah so we um we are nearing the end of this episode josh and we like to end our podcast by asking our guests a, a simple question because this uh podcast is called voices we ask our guests about the voice or voices that have been an inspiration to them so for you we'd like to ask you what voice or voices have been an inspiration for you have guided you um, and help shape the work that you do this is such a tough question because i think I've been fortunate to have many voices that have supported me or played a role, but I think the one that I would identify, and it's because it's the most recent interaction I remember, uh, would have to be uh, um, uh, what he started off as my middle school civics teacher, then became my AP US history teacher. Remember, I'm from a small town, so the teachers go up with you. And then randomly became a professor uh, my senior year of undergrad. So this man saw me from sixth grade, 10th grade to a senior of undergrad and recently connected with him uh, to talk about the work that he was doing and supporting specifically getting black males into education at my undergrad uh, and wanted to pick my brain about ideas. And I told him because I never had a chance to reconnect with him that uh, this man, so his name is Dr. David Lacasio, was so instrumental in supporting me and others early on, especially thinking about in a rural community in Virginia. Uh, I think in my high school class, there was maybe 40 of us, so that just gives you the scope and scale that we're talking small. But I never felt like when I was in his class or having conversations with him, I never felt like I was limited by the fact that I was in a certain community or in a school and didn't have access to so many other things that I, would, I wouldn't find out even existed until I got to college. Um, but his support and push and drive early on, and I think being a male teacher, and I talked about kind of how my male teachers are so instrumental, I think, in me wanting to go into education, but I think he, I really give him credit for putting a drive in me or enabling this drive to come out and manifest itself to say, you know what, like don't allow your circumstances to dictate and control what's possible for you. And so it was really nice that at the end of our conversation, I told him this because it's just been something that I was thinking about and, and thinking back about teachers that have had an impact but truly as a sixth grader and then moving up with him, just having that voice of pushing you and supporting you, but yet still challenging you in so many ways. Um, I really think that was what helped me pursue this career in education and want to do that for other students and why I picked communities 
albeit slightly different than rural Virginia, but in areas that most people didn't necessarily want to go um, because they didn't find it as lucrative and they knew it was going to be challenging, that was my driving factor. I uh, was wanting to be there uh, for students to, to be that voice. So I think I would contribute or attribute uh, the voice I've really been inspired by lately was reconnecting with him uh, and having that conversation uh, and thanking him for, for that and what he did for so many years. I love that you shared a story about a teacher, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> made such an impression on you and your life and, you know, pretty much showed you there were no limits to your potential. And we need more teachers like him. And there are many, many um, out there. Uh, but the fact that you shared a story about this particular teacher, I think is very, um, very inspirational. Thank you for sharing that. No, Gosh, I, oh, I want to thank you again for your time uh, and for sharing, you know, with us your work that you do uh, now at the Siegel Family Endowment, your thoughts on COVID, your experiences with COVID. Um, just want to say we really appreciate you. Thank you for being on our show. No, absolutely. Thank you so much, Lynn. It was great to be a part of the, the conversation and discussion. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Josh Elder uh, from the Siegel Family Endowment. You can catch us on social media with the handle at GT underscore CCEC or at constellations.gotech.edu. Thanks for listening in on today's episode. Be kind. Take care of each other out there. Thank you.